dear friends i hope you are all keeping well my guest today is a young writer of historical fiction sahadia day he is also a columnist and a fellow of the royal asiatic society of great britain and ireland it is indeed very refreshing to hear a young person's perspective on how to invigorate and revitalize the indian arts and culture it, it's great to have you today on chat with chitra why thank you so fine i'm doing well you know the covid 19 as uh... to stop the world like nothing before absolutely but still we are we are managing we are surviving hmm. and we're giving our best yeah so you grew up in kolkata tell me something uh, right. a little more about yourself and uh, how you were raised so uh, actually I'll, i'm not uh, actually from kolkata you know i'm not in proper kolkata it's a bit far from here so i'm in midnapur <laughs> and this is a place uh, where you'd find a lot of uh, suburban people so it is kind of a city uh, but uh, it has its origins as a village so it is a suburban area and uh, well uh, as my family is mostly into academic background so my race was basically you know i found a lot of books ever since i was born and i i found a lot of interest in those history works and the historical uh, narratives then uh, i i found a lot of similarities and i i found interest in comparative literature etc so that is how everything went right so you're still in school are you yeah 11th standard okay you have authored two books how did it come to you so actually when i first uh, started uh, reading devdutt patnaik he's a mythological uh, yes. genius actually so uh, he has all those uh, you know different versions of ramayana in his works so where you find uh, the fralak fraram uh, from thailand you have the ramayana of china then and all those narratives put out together to show how these versions are actually working and uh, so when i first read his book i found like that yeah so this could be done you know uh, all these compositions could be taken together and i could create a real version of ramayana together to make out one more book so that is how uh, my first love for mythology was born now how the book came out was another story in itself because uh, when i was uh, it was during the summer vacations you know of uh, 2017 so that then i was in plus 7 most probably so uh, my father and mother had gone out for work so and i felt like i could have really done something you know i could really do something and then i started uh, using all these uh, ideas from devdutt patnaik from amish tripathi and thought of creating a book a poetry book first on ramayana so right. after it was born i uh, i thought there could be a sequel to it definitely and that's when the idea for writing a drama on ramayana was born because the drama on ramayana is something that has not been regularly written you know and uh, if it is in english and french that creates a more uh, that, 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 that outspreads what you want to write about and mm-hmm. when i wrote the drama on ramayana my second book so it is not basically on ramayana it's always on uh, the ancestors of ram it's on the surya vansh that uh, no one has ever talked about we are always talking about ram and his uh, and sita and lakshman we didn't necessarily see raghu the other uh, signs of surya vansh it's a class so what... of the surya vansh right yeah mm. yes yes so yeah. it is entitled uh, the chronicles of surya vansh the title of the book is the chronicles of surya vansh right so you have focused more on the the ancestors of lord rama yeah right that's that's really very interesting how long did it take to get that into a book format mm. as such Well first of all when i was writing you know i had to do a lot of research about who the ancestors exactly were and where did they descend from what lineages they belong to and how are sita and ram related and if ram and ravana cousins as devdutt patnaik says so uh, in doing that it took a lot of time so it was around a year that i took to write the book uh, with 6 months of research devoted to research 6 months and 6 months to write the book in itself amazing i it must have been a real challenge for you you know yeah. hard writing now have you always wanted to become a writer or was it just by chance No, uh, it's like I always wanted to express. You know, I, I always wanted to express what I thought. I always wanted to express what I learned. So mm-hmm. the best way to do so is to write. You know, to write articles, mm-hmm. to write books, to write newspaper columns, and so I thought that's the best way I could do because that is the way I could spread my learnings towards people. Uh, as a matter of fact, that people would get to know these are the ancestors of Ram. They have not only about Ram. If you talk about uh, uh, my interests, my interests are devoted to mythology. We have history in there. So I also like classics literature, which is Greek and Roman literature. So I have a lot of interests, you know, diverse. Right. Very interesting that you've been introduced to history and uh, mythology. Right from a very young age, how do you have access to all these resources? My father, he's having a lot of you know access to the library since he's a professor. So uh, from a young age, I got to uh, access some of his collections. Along with that, I uh, he he uh, bought me books of uh, as I said of various authors who have really done a lot of work, you know, in bringing out the narratives that had been long lost in the pages of history, and uh, and rewriting them in a format that would find appealing to people of today. 
So that is the main goal of uh, what we what we try to write. Right, that's that's very very interesting. Where do you draw your inspiration from? Perhaps your father. Yeah, or... there are many people you know who inspired me directly or indirectly. So there were authors who indirectly inspired me, authors whom I could never really meet. Right. Do you have a favorite? Yes. Uh, yes, I have uh, two of them. David Patnaik and Amish Tripathi. So these guys really bring out the narratives in a form that is uh, really invigorating. You know, it they 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 re bring the classics to the modern version, especially Amish. He has a lot of way. Mm. And uh, Devdutt is one of those men uh, who brings out the entirety of the different versions of uh, the thing he writes on. And he tries to compare these with each other. And uh, he finds out uh, an exact similarity or an exact difference. So I was reading this book by Devdutt called Olympus yesterday. So mm. there he has talked about the Greco-Roman literature in the Indian perspective. So uh, when you're talking about the Greco-Roman literature in the Indian perspective, so there are various, uh, you know, for example, if I talk about Apollo, the sun god in Greece. So he has talked about Phoebus, who is the sun god in Rome and about Surya, who is the sun god in the Hindu mythology. So yeah. we also have Ra, who is the sun god in the Egyptian mythology and uh, Knossos and uh, Atum, who are the god of the dawn and the god of the afternoon, respectively. So this is what I like best about Devdutt. You get to know so much from his work. Information from different cultures. It is very intriguing to read all these uh, different cultures, find a similarity between cultures, isn't it? Mm. it it's, I think it's, it's very interesting. Uh, yes, yeah, very interesting. Huh. It's interesting, you know, because uh, when you're talking about the cultural background of uh, the world's oldest civilizations, so you have Greece, you have Egypt, you have India. So all of these have the same kind of gods. Now that creates an effect that, well, these might also have the same kind of stories and they do have. Now, if you talk about Hercules, who slayed the Nemean lion in one of his 12 livers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have this Nemean lion and a statue of Heracles called the Mathura Heracles in India. Mm -hmm. So this statue was discovered way back in, 18, 18, uh, in the 19th century by Sir Alexander Cunningham. So, uh, so if you talk about the legend of Heracles, it is quite similar to the legend of uh, Krishna. If you talk about uh, Dwarka, which was Krishna's capital, we have Thebes in Greece, which was defeated by the Epigoni or the seven commanders who led siege over there. Yeah. So that is very interesting. In fact, you, you get to know so much, you know, all about the diversities of the religion and where the things differ. That is what matters. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah, because our philosophers might have thought the same thing, you know, they always have the same characters, they have the same stories, they have the same backgrounds, the, the same powers, the gods have the same powers. Your Surya is the god of the sun, the Apollo is the god of the sun. We have Zeus, who has Thunderbolt, then we have Indra, who even has Thunderbolt. So we have a lot of similarities in between. That is what I like best about Devdutt. For you to take up at such a very young age, uh, that is all the more, uh, you know, inspiring. In your second book, you have focused more about the ancestors of Lord Rama. It must have been a great challenge to get all the information. Well, it was a great challenge, you know, because uh, if you talk about uh, these authors that I talked about, they generally focus on Rama. So they have a lot of writings on Rama, but not about his ancestors. Mm. So talking about his ancestors, we had to go through a lot of uh, library digital collections. And there are various manuscripts that are available for the Royal Asiatic Society, you know, mm. that talk about the Sanskritic classics, the Sanskrit texts, which mm. have been translated into, in, into the English version. We also have various books. For example, I came to know that this uh, Ramayana, there were two versions at first. So that was Valmiki Ramayana. The second is the Hanuman's Ramayana. Yeah. So the Hanuman's Ramayana was a more comprehensive and the more detailed version of Ram's uh, tales. But when Hanuman found that Valmiki was egoistic about his Ramayana, so he tore it up and he, and he just uh, left it as it was in rubbles. That, that is where the Valmiki Ramayana comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in Valmiki's Ramayana also, there are, now there are various stories in Ramayana, you know, which have come over through the ages, which are not really present at first in the Valmiki Ramayana. For example, if I talk about the Uttarakhanda, where mm. Love Kush becomes the king and uh, Ram dies and Lakshman dies. So this is just one of those uh, evolution as it goes on. You know, you find one ancestor, you will find another name some years after, then another author will be coming in and he'll be transferring it according to his own wishes. So the, they do another research, they find something new, they change it and that is the evolution of literature. So uh, the, what we learned today as Ramayana is not exactly Valmiki's Ramayana. It has been written down by thousands of scholars who have uh, worked day and night to bring out the entire comprehensive verse that we find today. True, sure, I know. And when you say ancestors, uh, how many descendants? Well, uh, in the first uh, page of my book, I, uh, I gave a lineage, you know, a genealogy table of uh, Surya Vansh and uh, the Vansh of Mithila, that is the Vansh to which Sita belonged or Janak belonged. I took almost uh, the entirety of them, you know, 
starting from Ikwaku till the end. The, the, the last king is called Sumitra. So he was defeated by this poor Pushyamitra Sunga or the, the establishment, you know, uh, 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 and that followed the establishment of a dynasty that was not the Kshatriya dynasty. So Ayodhya was ravaged by this king's letter on. And uh, Ram was in the middle, actually. So Dashrat, after Dashrat comes Ram, uh, Dashrat's father is called Aja. Aja loves his wife called Indumati. So we have stories of this very slightly in Devdar, but it's not much detailed. Uh, uh, and detail is what you want to bring out before people. I know your aim is to bring out the importance of all the ancestors about this clan. Well, the Hindu mythology and legends are already very enticing. Why do you think they yeah. are not currently accessible to many? Why are people not uh, reading these tales? And uh, would you say that um, there is a need to uh, invigorate and revitalize uh, this art and culture? Uh, yes, definitely. The basic thing why people do not read uh, classics these days is mm -hmm. what, what I found from uh, Ovid. You know, I was reading a book of Ovid last day called Metamorphosis. So uh, it was written in a very uh, difficult tone and uh, you have so many complicated ideas over there. So it is a really much difficult for people, for normal people to get what is written over there because it is always half Latin, half Greek and, and uh, you don't get an idea of what it means in English and it is in poetic form. So uh, authors, so basically there are scholars who've studied this works and have brought out before us even I was I wasn't much aware of the Indian classics like Ramayana and Mahabharata before Devdutt brought about uh, a very simple and a very subtle tone he, he narrated these incidents so also in Olympus you find so many characters in Greece so there are lots of characters to remember you cannot remember all of them for example talk about Castor and Pollux and if you compare them with the Ashwini Kumars of India so uh, Ashwini Kumars are the fathers of Nakul and Saharev. Now, people nowadays hardly know about who these uh, Ashwini Kumars were. So where does this come from? Because they uh, tend to study one of those smaller versions of the epic when they are, uh, when they are children, you know. So they find this, uh, this uh, what should I say? They find these comic books or these graphic novels and this DC, Marvel, all those things interesting, more interesting than they uh, find uh, these mythological tales. If I give you an example, an illustration of Thor, who was a very popular character from Avengers. Thor was actually one of those Nordic mythological heroes. So even he belongs to the mythological epic, you know. He's the king of the uh, Nordic mythology. He's equivalent to Zeus in Greece and to Indra in Hinduism, but people hardly know about Thor as a, as a mythological figure. They know Thor as an Avenger, and that is where the problem lies. I mean, the, the filmmakers especially, they nowadays tend to create a lot of imagination in them, and they give them a lot of superpowers and superhuman effects, and that really, that is why these mythological tales fade out. Uh, as long as we continue to study these distorted versions of mythological epics and all these stories and mix them up with all, all the modern versions and the uh, fantasy retellings, so we will never get to know what the actual classical thing was. We'll never get to know what our scholars had written uh, ages ago or centuries ago. That is where the main difference lies, the main, the main disadvantage lies of these uh, fantasy retellings. Right, but that's very true and I think uh, you have done uh, translation in French also and I'm sure yes you have created yeah. a wider audience. The authenticated information through your book can raise uh, more of an awareness uh, through, to all the youngsters also one of your uh, aims as well. Why I started writing these epics has a very important point behind it. You know, I wanted to bring out the uh, the exact, as you said, the authenticated information uh, in front of people. The way this has to be presented, you know. Nowadays, if you talk about the youth, they are more interested generally in uh, tales that are very simple and subtle to understand that are very, uh, uh, that are very easy actually. You know, they find, uh, they find comfortable to go with that. That so and and not and you do not necessarily tend to use a lot of jargons in the film. Also, I'm not much in um, I'm, uh, besides mythology, a lot of interest with medieval history, which is the Mughal period and the Islamic period of the of the Indian uh, history. This would be one of those things where I can blend the knowledge of history along with the knowledge of fiction. So that is called the historical fiction. In case of mythology, it's called the mythological fiction or the neo mythology. That is the recreation of mythological tales in your own version. Ramayana is as its exact form, but in his book you will find that there are various. Uh, uh, information you know there is there are a lot of lots of information that are not true to its exact version for example the rivalry between Suryavansh and Chandravansh never existed so he has said that Suryavansh was an enemy of Chandravansh and they were like uh, all those nemesis but that never really existed and so that is one of his own creations that is what we call as neo mm. so as a storyteller what are you trying to achieve well I'm trying to uh, reinvigorate and revitalize the 
role that uh, our ancient epics, that are stories of history, you know, that have been lost, long lost in the annals of Hindustan. So, and the, the, the importance they play in today's world. If you talk about a story, which I would tell you now, uh, Didalus and Icarus. So Icarus was this person who flew too near to the sun. We have this story in uh, our Indian mythology too. So this was the Hanuman who was flying way towards the sun and he got struck by lightning. So uh, this is what happens. Now, if you are aiming for a position higher than what your expectations or what your original, uh, what, what your desires are. So if you're aiming for too much, you know, you always get a fall. So this is a lesson to learn from the epics and that people do not necessarily see. Even cinemas have lots of lessons to learn from them, but there are various people who just only see them as visual representation and not the actual lesson that it embodies. So I feel that is what I wanted to bring out. I'm quite intrigued when you say similar story, you know, Hanuman reaching out to the sun and you also have a similar one in Greek mythology. If I talk about both of these epics, India and Greece. So uh, India and Greece have lots of gods. Hinduism has originally, you know, they have God of, gods for everything. There is where you find the same characteristics. It's not because that they have copied uh, necessarily from one another. They have lots of different tales. If you talk about India, India has uh, three heavens. The first is the Swarga, the second is Kailash, the third is Vaikund, which is the highest above all the Vishnu resides. Yeah. But in Greece, there is one such heaven, which is Mount Olympus where Zeus and his companions reside. There are differences. There are lots of differences in between. There are, there are lots of, uh, but if you talk about authentic, uh, uh, authenticated versions of the tales, uh, so both of these are, you know, these are uh, characteristics in their own form. They have their importance in their own retellings. But I should say that there are a lot of similarities, you know, there are more similarities than differences in between. Yeah. That's where the thing lies. Okay. And if you talk about which was the first version written, uh, a person was asking me, so is the Indian mythology older than the Greek mythology? or the Greek mythology older than the Indian mythology. If I would tell you, you know, uh, Hindu mythology has been written over centuries and centuries and millennia, and so has been the Greek mythology. So yeah. if you talk about, uh, if I take an example from Callimachus, who was a Greek poet, uh, I should say he was an ancient Roman poet actually, uh, who wrote Greek mythology. Then there was Lucretius, Virgil, uh, Ovid, who, uh, translate, uh, who, who, who transliterated their versions from the earlier ones. They added something, they removed something. And that is where we come today. Now, in the Hindu mythology, there was the same thing. You have lots of authors who add something and some take away something. And so th these are necessarily not uh, all, nothing is older because all the mythology was not written by one single person. There were thousands of them through, through eras and generations who continued to write these epics. Very true. Very true. Yeah. So I've always been intrigued and I think uh, you've explained it so well. I'm sure uh, people who are watching this Thank book you. would be equally enlightened with that. Uh, your first book uh, was rather, it was a poem, right? And your second was yeah. a proper book. Could you share uh, any particular instance? I'm sure you would have faced a lot of challenges in, you know, in, either in terms of getting resources or, you know, managing your time because you're still a school student, um, you're a student uh, of year 10, did you say? Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, it's 11th. 11th. Year yeah. 11. Okay. So you just finished your uh, GCSEs. Huh? No, I'm an ICSE. ICSE, IC board. It's CISC board. All right. Right. So can you um, share just one instance of any kind of a challenge that you have faced, um, you know, in uh, yeah. writing these uh, two books, because it is it is not easy for uh, a student, mm. especially uh, as young as you, because we get swayed away easily with so many distractions. Uh, given the with the technological advancement, uh, there, there are so many distractions. Yeah. I, I do agree that you are very very uh, passionate about it, but you must have faced some challenge um, along the way. Would you like to share any particular instance? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I did. So uh, I did. Uh, so it was when I was uh, starting to write my second book, you know, the one that was called The Chronicle of Surya Vansh and it was written in drama format. So now, you know, drama is a very hard thing to write. You have to express the emotions of the characters in the form of words. And that takes a lot, a lot of time, you know. And uh, when I was uh, writing down and now we had all these examinations between them, the half yearly and examinations, the annual examinations. So I necessarily uh, was more interested in writing of the drama format completely rather than uh, giving all these examinations at first hand. Now I had to divide my time between, but my main uh, motto was to complete my book first rather than the examinations later. So now th then what I faced was uh, 
quite a bit of obstacles to my parents who thought that going for the examination would be much more appreciable than if you talk about uh, writing the book because that could be done later. But if you if you talk about a writer, you know, once he starts writing a book and if you procrastinate, it becomes uh, it, it, it does not become a good work and uh, you lose your uh, you lose the smoothness that you start writing it with you lose the passion that you have within you you lose the fire you know the fire yeah. tends to, to dim down and uh, so i had to undergo you know a severe uh, the conflicts within my inner self as to which one should i focus as the uh, bigger uh, which one should have the bigger importance in my perspectives eventually i i, I found myself dividing my time uh, correctly and well i did so fairly well in the both examinations held uh, this year and uh, so that's all. Amazing, because uh, you were very, were very correct. Um, from a parent's perspective, uh, they must be equally anxious uh, for you to do well in mm. your exams. And you, as a very passionate young writer, it, it's really mm -hmm. um, good to know that you have uh, struck a, a right balance and you have not only succeeded in uh, your book writing as well as uh, you know doing well in your exams for a student of your age uh, you have really accomplished um, you know you have so many accomplishments uh, thank you, you thank you amazing as a young writer i also see you are a columnist and you write on gender equality that's uh, yeah i read in a very interesting how did how did this thought process start? Uh, what actually uh, well, prompted you? Gender equality was basically start. Uh, you know, I started writing on gender equality basically after. Uh, going through all the characters of mythology and history who are women but play a very important role. Uh, for example, if I tell you about Cleopatra of Egypt, if I talk to you about uh, Rukmati of India, if you talk about uh, Helen of Sparta or Helen of Troy, as people might call her. So everything, after all, you have a woman character who is the main protagonist in the story and it is the men who are fighting for her. So. I, I think she's a, a woman is always one of those central figures in every in every classics in every in every uh, historical narratives in every historical uh, fiction books and uh, uh, I do have such views that women should be empowered in our society at least for the betterment of the society and they should be given a chance to contribute in, in the best way that they can because this is what is essential in today's world you know and that is why I th I think I write on gender equality, but yeah, I write on gender equality in the perspectives of mythology and not the uh, modern world. In the perspectives of how mythology and gender equality related in, as a relevance to the modern world. Absolutely, I mean that's amazing. Um, probably um, it's because of your, uh, you know, interest in uh, Indian mythology that has uh, actually prompted you to, uh, you know, write more about gender equality and create more awareness. As a young author, is it? easier to write for adults as it is to write for children i necessarily write on write for uh, i do not know if it is easy to write for children because i've never gone to the ch children genre you know but uh, yes writing for children necessarily means that you have to express the thing you write in the most simplest manner possible yeah. because children tend to have because uh, and, and one more thing you know they uh, you should see that the, the main fact is always told to them they understand what you write because if you just use a lot of jargons, if you use lots of culverines and, and, and flint blunderbusses and sort of cannons and guns and children will get messed up with all your writings and they'll find like, oh my God, I'm not able to understand a single word over here. So what is this useful for? Yeah. And if you're talking about the adults, it's, it, it's easy to write for the adults as in, in my perspective, because as I have seen, because if, if, I'll give you an instance. So in my uh, book, that is upcoming book, uh, which I have signed up with Rural Obligations India. So there we, there I have one term called Culverine and there is another term called Flint Blunderbuss. So people who ask me why I use terms as such, instead of uh, cannons and guns when these could be so easily you know implemented in my work and and so easily understandable now culverine is generally used to denote a 16th century cannon that was used during those times so cannon and culverine are not the same so people do take it to be the same nowadays but they do have different origins they do have different uh, uh, etymology is yeah. too. And in case of Flint blunderbuss, it was a musket that had a single a bullet in it. And if you talk about guns, guns are of different types. You know, you have pistols, revolvers, you have all those uh, machine guns, you have submachine guns. Yeah. So you also even have a bazooka. So 
this is necessarily uh, this was just one of those types so if i talk about writing for adults so you can write this and express this in the most simplest way possible you can write flint blunderbuss and they'll get to understand what you're trying to express but if you write for children you get to have you have to specify well it's a gun with a single bullet in it and that when shot fires up a people along its head yeah yeah so you're also relating it to no which era it was and uh, it was predominantly used rather than using the common terminology mm -hmm. uh, you know so yeah. that, that's very true and uh, for children especially i think you need to keep uh, the the idea very very simple so that the main message mm -hmm. is not lost children have necessarily lost their interest in classics because so have their parents it is all those evolutionary traits you know today we have got so much of education to complete you know if i talk about my friends i see a lot of them dealing uh, with a lot of them dealing very hard you know with science they they have lots of exams they have lots of competitive things to keep up with they have those coaching centers then they have the teachers they have private tuitions they have uh, the school teachers and so so how would they get time to read all about culture art and artistic when these does not carry any relevance in our field today so people I would say a very interesting thing, you know. Uh, I would just came across Manu Pillai, uh, who was uh, who is an, an Indian author of historical fiction as well. So he told one day nowadays, you know, people who are dealing with culture, art, architecture, and classics are uh, seem to be like you know mad people in front of the crazy world who's always running after the. I should say money, then you know success and competitive exams and all those because the mentality of the youth today has changed and that should be if you consider uh, keeping yourself at a back step with the classics and culture and and art and heritage and you continue studying that in the perspectives of Ovid and Nakistas thousands of years ago so you 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 lose your relevance with the modern world you lose the race so that no one wants to do and so this is why culture has lost lost its relevance because uh, no one tend to read it nowadays. Yeah, because, uh, you know, when, back in India, especially when you're growing up, you are exposed to all these uh, mythological stories, uh, traditional folk stories from different villages, from uh, different parts of India. Hmm. And, uh, you know, stories about kings and queens who ruled, uh, you know, so many years, uh, back, decades ago. So all these, in directly or indirectly, they, they get imbibed inside us and uh, we are at least aware to a certain extent how much of importance is given to the historical relevance is something which um, you know we really need to uh, question and uh, we need to think about that now as a young writer you would like to bridge this gap See, bridging a gap is, uh, qu becomes quite easy as I told you earlier when you create something that appeals to the modern generation so uh, I have seen, you know, if you talk about Harry Potter, Harry Potter is one of those biggest blockbusters in the world of writing. So J.K. Rowling. So J.K. Rowling was originally a classic student. So she studied those Greco Roman and Latin scriptures originally. And then she went on to write Harry Potter. If you, uh, I'll take you two characters. Harry Potter. The first is the basilisk that Harry Potter eventually kills. The basilisk is a serpent who was originally existent in the Greco Roman culture. And the second was a dog who had three heads. So we have this dog called Cerberus, a hound actually, Cerberus in the Greco-Roman mythology. And he is the protector of the underworld with Hades. Mm -hmm. So he is the pet of Hades. But uh, yeah, that is true. But uh, to, 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 to find more relevance in today's world, you have to create characters like that. So you have to create a plot that is fantasy. You have to bring lots of grouping tales in it. You have to, uh, and then you have to add some classical and mythological elements within so that people, when they read it, you know, they come to know a certain bit about what they have been taught. So I would, I have criticized Troy, the cinema earlier, and have also told you about various of the other uh, epics that distort the original mythological version. But if you talk about a little bit of what, is, what remains, yes, I would appreciate that these cinemas have, are still being made on such historical and mythological topics. I think uh, the basic way as to how you could, uh, how, as to how you could spread the learnings of mythological tales and the epics among the today's uh, youth, you know, is to create them, is to recreate them and retell them in various forms, in the forms of songs, drama, dance, music, uh, in the forms of cinema, books, uh, art, paintings, whatsoever it is. And that is the best way you could possibly, you could possibly, uh, you know, spread it to at least 1% of the youth that exists today. Fantastic. That's, I think that's a very, very important uh, message to all the, the youngsters. And I'm sure uh, this would be your advice to the, uh, the young authors also. What are your future plans? Do you have any uh, books uh, that uh, 
or uh, to be currently published or uh, in progress? Yes, last week I announced a book deal through my official Instagram account, uh, which I'm going to sign, uh, which I've signed up with Rupa, Rupa Publications India. So Rupa is one of India's leading publishers. They have top authors like David Patnaik, Chetan Bhagat, etc. So, well, I'm going around with them for this next book. Now, it is not on mythology, it is on historical fiction. So here I have a plot from the medieval India. So what I created, a lot of my, my blend into it. Uh, we will have, have a theme release shortly. Well, I feel like, uh, yeah, so I'm going for this project. Well, I also had another plan in mind. So at the present moment, I'm trying to read and grasp as much as Greco-Roman literature and Latin I can I can read because that creates a, a greater impact for me, you know, because I get already, um, uh, I have read all those uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata. I do have some idea about them. I do have a bit of idea. Now I need to compare these mythological retellings with the tellings of the Greece and Rome and, and how these really compare to one another. For example, in, in Greece and Rome, you have Iliad and Odyssey and Ramayana uh, and here you have Ramayana and Mahabharata, the two main things of both these countries and both these cultures. So are these really relevant to one another or are these having much similarities and that is what questions me now. So I am I'm studying all those. I hope to soon I'll, I'll bring out something soon about all these things. Well, I, I'm also writing much articles. You know, I'm writing articles about Ovid and his Ages of Mankind on Stroll, The Sunday Guardian, uh, WIOM by Z News, Times of India, etc. So, look, so yeah, I'm trying to do as much as possible to uh, reinvigorate and reignite the cultural glory that our ancient civilization had once had. It's very interesting and. Uh... Um, I really want to wish you all the very best. Your favorite food? It's dosa, dosa. 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 South India, okay. dosa. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How would you describe yourself in three words? Uh, three words. Well, so I'm much determined and passionate about what I do and I'm really much hobbistic. Okay. What's that something most people do very easily but you find it difficult? Uh, complete a book because people tend to uh, complete a book just as they go through it. I tend to complete a book after analyzing each and every line of it so that creates a lot of time, you know. I take a lot of time to complete one particular book uh, up to the end. Fair so enough. I take a lot of time in these. Fair enough. Your favorite movie? Troy. Hmm. Okay. 2004. What food have you never eaten but would really like to try? It's a chicken handi. Okay. What's the funniest joke you know by heart? Oh, excuse me? What is the funniest joke you know by heart? Uh, Nestor. Nestor was one of those uh, Trojan heroes who was a uh, Greek heroes, was a wise old man and William Wordsworth in his book Merchant of Venice, he had one of those Nestor's joke uh, and that is what I feel is the funniest thing that I've ever heard. Right. What bit of trivia do you know that is very interesting but also very useless? The Himalaya mountains were once the Tethys Sea. Okay. Mm. What are the common traps for aspiring writers? Excuse me? Uh, what are the common traps for aspiring writers? Yeah. The first is the publication houses because you need to see there are three processes actually self publishing, vanity publishers, and traditional. Traditional is the best, then self, and then comes vanity. So this is the first thing. The second thing is the luring of the market activity and distribution because there are people who ask you to pay for your own distribution and that is not something is very good. But aspiring writers are willing to go with it. Ah, right, right. <clears throat> What's your favorite underappreciated novel? Sirs by Medallion Miller. It's not exactly underappreciated. People read it a lot, but here nobody has ever read it. Nobody's ever heard of it actually. In, in the place where I live. Right. Okay. So this brings us to the end of this uh, wonderful chat. I hope you enjoyed. Definitely. I, I had a great time. I would like to wish you all the very best. Have a great future. So all the very best, uh, Sohadia. Thank I you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.